All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar for this evening. It's good to have you all. I see that people are still trickling in, and as they do, I think we'll get started in the meantime and do some introductions. Um, welcome back. I see some familiar names here in the, in the attendees. Um, I see some COA names, some COA families popping up. I see some COA staff, and I also see a, a good mix of of people from outside COA. So welcome to everybody, uh, whether you're a part of COA Academy or outside, uh, we wanna give you a warm welcome this evening and say thank you for setting aside some time to join us. And um, we've got people joining us from across the country and a few other countries as well, Southern Africa. And I know that we've got at least one um, up in the Northern Hemisphere. So good to have you this evening. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this evening's conversation. This is something that I think is, is very close to my heart as an educator something that I'm particularly passionate about, which is thinking about the future of our children's uh, education, where they're headed, what the workplace is gonna be like for them one day, how best to set them up for success. And so whether you are joining us tonight as a parent, which I think is the majority of us, or as an educator, um, and you're thinking about how to put this into practice um, in your own career, or maybe you are a high schooler yourself, and it's good to have you uh, this evening as well. Um, my name is Mark, and I'm the principal of COA Academy, which is an online school uh, based in South Africa. We are an IEB online school for grades four to 12, and uh, we are really enjoying the online space and what it has to offer, particularly when it comes to the sort of conversation that we're going to have tonight around the future of work and what this means for us. Um, I'm joined this evening by Meg. Meg joins us from Fully Alive. Meg is um, somebody who uh, we have a great deal of respect for at COA, uh, which is why we begged her to join us tonight for this particular topic. Uh, Meg is an expert in this area, and if there is any voice I would want to have in this conversation, it's Meg's. Um, and we really do align on uh, a lot of the principles and, and sort of values behind what she's going to share with us tonight. So I'm really excited to hear more from Meg, a little bit about her. Uh, she is the founder and owner of Fully Alive. And she is a self-proclaimed passionate people developer. Uh, that is her passion and her drive. And she works with both individuals and with teams to help them realize their purpose and fulfill uh, their full potential. And uh, she'll describe a little bit more about herself and Fully Alive uh, later on uh, in the webinar. Uh, but we're really looking forward to hearing from you tonight, Meg. So thank you very much for joining us. For all of you who are listening in um, as attendees, like I said, a very warm welcome to you and relax. Uh, we love these webinars because it gives you a chance to kick up your feet. Uh, Meg was saying we're, we're on screen, so we can't really kick up our feet until it's over, but uh, you guys can, and you can grab a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and uh, really make yourselves comfortable. Um, you'll probably see uh, in your Zoom panel at the bottom that the chat feature has not been uh, enabled for this evening, but we have opened up the Q&A option. So if you want to hover over the Q&A at the bottom, uh, go ahead and click on the Q&A right now and open it up and just have it ready. Um, I think we want to give a good amount of time towards the end of this for any questions that you might have. Um, you've got an awesome opportunity this evening to pick Meg's brain and ask her some questions that might surface as she talks. Uh, the topic that we're covering this evening is a very broad topic when we think about the future of work and what's happening in the workplace and what does this mean for our current high school generation? Uh, what does this mean for their education? What does this mean for their tertiary education? What does this mean for their future? There are a lot of things that connect with us. Uh, when Meg and I were talking earlier, she used the word complex, and I thought that's the perfect word uh, to use for this sort of topic. It is complex. And so as we're discussing some things tonight, and maybe we just have time to touch on some of the core central ideas, you might have things that pop up for you that you'd really like to find out more about. Put those in the Q&A. Um, hopefully we'll be able to address them for you this evening. If we don't, uh, then we'll definitely get around to, to answering all of your, your questions um, in the coming days. So don't be shy with the Q&A. Put your thoughts down in there. We've got Debbie in the call as well. And uh, Debbie will be going through our, our questions and making sure that we get to, to all of the ones uh, that are relevant for this evening. So uh, don't be shy with that. All right. But let's get started. Uh, I want to start this evening with just a brief introduction uh, sort of and, and perspective on what's happening uh, from, from our point of view as COA Academy in the world of education. I want to set the scene for us to say, what do we see in terms of uh, the shifting sands uh, in, in the workplace and what's happening in 
education at the moment, what's happening in schools in South Africa and, and around the world. So let's call it setting the scene. Let's, let's set some context for this, this conversation this evening. We all know that there have been seismic changes when it comes to how we do work. A lot of this has been precipitated by COVID. We know that. We're, we're tired of that conversation. But actually, this conversation is rooted in decades of progress. And that progress has been rapidly accelerated in the last few years. But it has been a long time coming. And we've seen these changes over the last 10, 15 years just happening at an accelerated rate. And many of us as parents, as, as adults, have experienced firsthand how our own work is changing and adapting. And for some of us, we're in certain industries where we found that transition quite comfortable and natural. Some of us in industry, are in industries which have been eradicated. And 10 years ago, there was a company and today it doesn't exist. Um, and some of us are in, in a position more likely where we've had to adapt from one way of doing things to a whole new way of going about our work. Uh, sometimes that's been comfortable for us, sometimes it's been uncomfortable, but to some degree, we've all experienced uh, this shift, uh, this change from uh, the way that we used to do things to how we're doing things now. And so I want to ask the question, what does this mean for education? What does this mean for how we're doing teaching and learning in the classroom? And so I just want to share with us a, a few thoughts. Um, and so I'm going, to, I'm going to share my screen with you again. And I'm just going to go through a, a few of these ideas uh, which have, have largely come out of investigation that we've done as an online school into what is relevant learning these days. What do we see in terms of what's needed in the schooling space, both junior schools and high schools? And so we've done a lot of research into how to set up the, the learning for best practice. And uh, we've relied on a, a lot of sources for this. Uh, this particular summary that I'd like to walk us through uh, now comes from the Pew Research Center, which is a fantastic source for looking into what's happening in the world of work, uh, in case you do want to go and do some of your own research. Um, but they suggest that there are, amongst others, uh, five key things that we need to be looking uh, for in our education today uh, to be relevant to what's happening in the world around us. And so these are central ideas for us at Co Academy, and these uh, inform and feed into how we go about doing our teaching and learning. So I'd like you to I'd like to walk you through a few of these. I'll touch on a few of them very briefly, and I'll I'll settle on a couple for a little bit longer. Let's start with the first one. Uh, we know that our children are digitally native. Um, for those of us who remember the Nokia thirty one ten, can you remember that phone? Yep, the one that you could drop out of a helicopter and into a burning lake of fire, and it would still work. Uh, if you remember having and owning one of those phones, uh, you do not belong to the digitally native group. Uh, we, we're too old for that group, but our children are not. Our children were born into a digitally native group. And what we want to see in education today is we want to see the way that we're doing our teaching and learning, that it's relevant to somebody who was born into a world that is digital, that is digitally connected. Now, that doesn't mean that everything has to be online. Even as an online school, we don't believe that everything needs to be embedded online, but we do believe that it needs to be relevant for an online world. Uh, for somebody who was born into a digital world, uh, it needs to be engaging in a way that makes sense to them, that connects to their understanding of the world. And so for a digital native, that means being digitally uh, aware. Um, something to be aware of here when we talk about digital natives is that being a digital native does not necessarily make you digitally literate. So this is something else that we see as key in education today, is preparing our young people for the future and preparing them for their workplace one day, is yes, they were born into a digital world, but does, that does not make you automatically digitally literate. Just like being born into uh, a, a world where we, you know, let's say everyone in the world around you speaks a certain language, uh, let's say your, your family is English speaking and you're born into the family, you don't automatically know how to speak, read and write English. You have to learn those skills. And the same is true for our learners today. If we want them to go into a digital world and excel, we have to take digital natives and make them digitally literate. And so our role as educators is to help them make that transition. The second thing uh, that came out of this research was that uh, schools and learning centers need to be giving a lot of thought to how to provide customized pathways. Uh, we are really excited about this in particular. 
at COA because we are able to really think out of the box as an online school in terms of what and how we offer content. Um, no longer are we on a linear path. Um, Meg will talk to us later about, you know, the idea that you know what you want to be when you're 12, you know what you want to be when you, you know, let's say when you're older, when you're 30. And so you're on this linear pathway where you have to study, study certain things in a linear progression and end up in a work that it sort of goes for 30 years, 40 years uninterrupted. That's no longer how we do our, our learning. Think of massive online courses. The key there is customizable pathways. The idea that there's a world of information that's accessible to me, and I then can access and navigate that world of information in a way that makes sense to me uh, in my time on my terms. To be honest, for those of us who are not digitally native, learning this way can be intimidating. It can be scary. Uh, we can be put out by the idea that there is not a linear path to my learning. Uh, but to those who are born into a digital world, this actually makes most sense. It's most comfortable. And more importantly, it's most productive for them. Thirdly, uh, something that's important is real world context. This has always been the case. Uh, learning has always needed to be rooted in real world context. We don't want it to be a sort of a isolated theory that never touches the real world. Uh, but at the same time, uh, more than ever, we want what we're doing in the classroom to connect with what's happening in the real world. The fourth thing on the screen here is soft skill focus. And this is something that in education over the last 20 years or so, we've really been talking a lot about, but we haven't seen any shifts in terms of um, underlying curriculum. Underlying curriculum is still very content heavy. And so what we're really trying to do, particularly at COA, is bring in those soft skills, not as an added on, not as an enrichment, but as a, as a core focus of what and who we are growing as a school. Uh, we know that these, and Meg will walk us through a little bit more about soft skills later on, these are going to be key in, in preparing our children for the future workplace. And finally, unbundled education. This is a concept that is tricky to wrap your head around at first. And so because of that, we're actually going to set up a whole nother webinar just to talk about unbundled education with our head of arts and culture, Majorzi, who loves this idea of unbundled education. The first time we had this conversation around how does COA work and what does this idea mean, I just remember his response was, man, what a game changer. What a game changer. That's what I wanted when I was in school. And so we'll be talking more in a separate webinar about unbundled education. But in a nutshell, uh, every technology, every system goes through a natural life cycle. And in the beginning of its life cycle, it makes sense to bundle together as much as possible and offer it at a, at, as, as a lower price. Perfect example of this, DSTV. We all know DSTV. DSTV is a great example of initially, it makes most sense to bundle as many TV shows together as possible. You've got your series, you've got your movies, you've got your history channel, you've got your sports. We're going to package it all together and offer it to you at one low price. That makes most sense in the beginning of a technology or a system. As time goes by and resources become cheaper and technologies become smarter and people's preferences become more specific, what ends up happening is it makes more sense to unbundle that offering. Think Netflix, think Spotify. And now actually what makes most sense is for me to pay for the services that I want most. And when I'm paying for the services that I want most, rather than a one-stop shop of everything, I actually get to save money, save time and focus on the things that matter most to me. And we're seeing that shift in education as well. So more on that topic of unbundled education soon. I want to finish before I hand over to Meg with a, a final thought on the COA tree. Uh, what is the COA tree and, and how does it matter to us? Um, for those of us who know about COA and know what the COA tree stands for, apologies for saying this again, but for those of us who guests and haven't heard this before, uh, the word COA, we named our school after a tree. Um, the koa tree has wood that is famous for two properties. It is both strong and flexible. And I love talking about the characteristics of a koa tree because when you hear those two words for the first time, they seem oxymoronic. They seem like they're in opposition to each other. They seem like they don't belong together, like they're in tension with each other. How can something be both strong and flexible at the same time? Strong implies concrete, uh, unmovable. Flexible implies bendy, uh, thinking, you know, rubbery. Uh, how can they be the same thing? And when you think of the wood of a koa tree, what we have there is, is wood that we can 
mold. It's malleable, but it's also durable and lasting. And so we use the wood of a koa tree to make things like musical instruments, where the, the, the curvature of the guitar needs to be uh, supple, but it needs to be strong. Uh, we also very often make wedding bands out of koa wood um, because it's malleable again, but it's durable. And this picture of the koa tree is really what we want both for a school and for the young people who are going into the future workplace one day. We think that those two characteristics are going to define the future success of the learners in our school. We want them to be resilient and strong and stable, but at the same time, we want them to be flexible and adaptive. We want them to be creative and critical thinkers. We want them to be malleable without breaking. And so that combination we believe is really gonna set them up for success in the future workplace. And uh, I hope you hear a little bit more sort of resonating through that when, when Meg shares with us. Um, on the screen are a few things that excite us about how we're building an environment that is both strong and flexible. I don't wanna get into that right now. I really wanna hear from Meg and hear how we're setting our, our kids up for future success. I know that that's what you're here for. So I'm gonna hand over to you now, Meg, and uh, we'll take some questions after that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. Appreciate that introduction. We pop over to screen share. Great. So as Mark said, I'm Meg, a self-confessed passionate people developer and also the founder of Fully Alive. In that capacity, I work with both individuals as well as in organizations helping people and helping teams to realize their potential. In organizations, I call it employee success. So it's a lot of different workshops, it's training, it's development around their people processes, it's company culture, all of those kinds of good things. Essentially helping companies to create a workplace in which people and teams can thrive. But with individuals, it's what I prefer to call purpose and potential coaching. And I distinguish that against uh, uh, terms like career guidance or career coaching. They're similar ideas, and I sometimes do use those because they are phrases that people know and, and understand. But I think purpose and potential coaching is something that almost comes a step before that, before you get into the, the decisions about career. It's about helping individuals, whether those are high schoolers as well as adults. Um, I think one of my oldest clients have been in their 50s and deciding on a career change, so we're never too old, um, to helping those individuals to discover and to connect to their driving passion. We all have something that gets our heart racing a little, that gives us goosebumps, that gets us out of bed in the morning and willing to actually put effort into that day. So it's about helping to connect to that driving passion and then also understanding what their areas of greatest potential are too. What sets you apart from others? What are the innate capacities, abilities, ways of thinking that you have that are so ingrained in you sometimes that you don't even realize that it's things that you do better relative to others. And the combination of those two, of purpose and of potential, when you're living in a space that uh, complements those, it's about living with joy. It's about living with passion, living with energy. The result is realizing greater fulfillment as well, both in your career as well as in your personal life too. So, that's just to say, I guess, that I'm not a career guidance counselor. I definitely defer to the educators and to the others who have a much deeper understanding of, of subjects and all of those types of areas. Um, I'm unfortunately not the person that you can ask if my child wants to study X, then what subject choices should I make? Uh, but I do and have helped many teams to make deeper and more informed decisions about those things by starting from a place of self-awareness and by giving them those tools to be able to make better decisions in all areas of life and of their future careers as well. So speaking of decisions, uh, a big one that many high schoolers are needing to make is what should I do, right? My job, my career, my studies, um, what, what will get me there um, to that job, that thing that I want to do? 
So we're going to have a quick poll if Mark can help me to get that kicked off. Um, and the question is, does your junior, because I understand there are perhaps some junior schoolers around in this conversation as well, your junior schooler or your high schooler, know what career they would like to pursue. And your options there are yes with strong certainty, some ideas, but not 100% or no, they are quite uncertain and possibly even overwhelmed. Mark, if you can just give me an indication of the responses. I don't actually right. see it on my side. I think they're coming in here, Meg. Cool. And all right, it looks like we're mostly there. We're gonna go ahead and end the poll there. I don't know if you can see that, Meg, but we've got 0% said yes with strong certainty. Okay. 59% said uh, some ideas, but not 100%. And 41% said uh, no, very uncertain and overwhelmed. Fair enough, that is probably quite a accurate <laughs> distribution. So everybody is either got some ideas, but not 100% or otherwise very uncertain and quite overwhelmed. Um, a little statistic, there are something like 31,000 different careers in the world out there. So it's no wonder that we are uncertain and overwhelmed or have some ideas and not 100% when that's the number of choices that we may need to make right now as well and it is really a big decision and it's one that's made even more difficult by this idea that we've called the future world of work or as we've titled our discussion today and what do we really mean by this idea what do we mean by the future world of work what is causing this to be such a buzzword or webinar worthy phrase and there are some things that are shaping this future world of work. Um, now we only have an hour webinar today, so this is definitely not an exhaustive list, but some of the things that we can think of that are causing or shaping this future world of work. Firstly, of course, technological disruption. Um, things, new technologies that are coming out, eliminating some industries, completely transforming others, creating brand new industries as well. I'm sure I don't need to go into that too much because it's something that we are all seeing and living on a daily basis. Next, we've got also um, societal and economic changes. How do we relate to each other on a macro level as humanity? Um, we've got increased interconnectedness, again, backed by technology. We've got shrinking of global boundaries. Um, and of course, we've seen the big changes in how we work together and how work is approached over the last two years with COVID. And then another big impacting factor is the workforce itself that is coming in or currently in the workplace, the so-called millennials and Generation Z or Z. These people are characterized by how tech savvy they are. They are practically born with a smartphone in their hands. I think we've all stop being surprised by the three-year-olds that know how to swipe and select their own YouTube channels before they can even safely sleep without a nappy on, right? <laughs> um, these are people that are driven by wanting to have flexibility, by their well-being being really important in the workplace. And there's a drive as well, a push for meaning, a push for purpose, for making a difference in their work. These generations are they're less interested in just clocking a nine to five and grabbing a paycheck at month end, but they want to know and they want to see how their work makes a difference in society or in the world out there. They want to be disruptors themselves, challenging the status quo around societal and environmental awareness, the usage of technology, pushing the boundaries between um, what's been done or been possible before. And all of these changes and many more um, that we don't have time to go into today means that the future world of work will be characterized by many jobs that don't even exist yet. And I thought it might be fun to think about what some of those jobs might be. Um, first one, ro robot consultants. These are professionals that might help families to select the robot model and software that will bring 
maximum benefit and kind of realization into their home and work life. So somebody who comes in, who evaluates your home, who discusses your needs with you and works out which robot will be best suited for your home. Another option maybe a rewilder, professionals who will be responsible for reversing the environmental impact and damage that humans have caused, helping us to restore the environment to its natural state in deforested areas, uh, waterways, marshes, etc. So rewilders, that might be another uh, career that one of your kids may pursue one day. And the last idea, a garbage designer. Um, these are engineers that will end up turning our waste products into useful projects. Probably a profession that will require a good background in science and engineering and industrial design, a whole lot of innovation and creativity as well. But bringing together all these, all the waste that we are producing as humans and working out how we can produce something useful from it. Lots more ideas out there. Those are just some of the ones that I thought were a bit more fun. And so the question is, in the face of all of that, in the face of this future world of work that we're looking at, is how do you actually prepare for uncertainty? Because that's, that's what we're facing. There's so many changes that are happening. What can you do now to be ready for the future that is being impacted by so many variables and is therefore constantly changing? I thought we'd put out another poll to see what your thoughts are in that respect. Which of these skills do you think are the most important for the future workforce to develop? Your options there are leadership, adaptability and problem solving, coding, teamwork and collaboration, reading, writing and maths, or empathy, compassion and tolerance. Let's put out the poll. I think this one's taking people some time, Meg. I think you've got them. Mm. This, one. this is a tricky one. <laughs> and the it's answers not are not coming in as quickly as they were in the last poll. But the, the, what I'm seeing here is really interesting so far. I'm, I'm, while people are just sending in their final answers, I think the thing that stood out to me when we were going through this earlier together is how hard it is to separate something like empathy from maths and how different these skills are on the list. Mm. All right, we've got... We've got most, most people have, have voted. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And this is really interesting to me. Have a look at this. We've got only two voted for. Adaptability <laughs> and problem solving with 95% of votes. And empathy, compassion, and tolerance with 5% of votes. Very, very interesting. Very yeah. And I think possibly the... Um, the discussion kind of preceding this of how things are changing, um, we need to, to stay on our toes, that might have been what kind of influenced and led towards the adaptability and problem solving being a favored answer as well, the introduction kind of the warning around how much things are changing, fair enough. Um, I think the truth is, though, that they're all important. Um, and so it would be definitely, I think it would be difficult to pick just one of those. Um, time again is a little bit short, so I'm just going to focus on two areas today that I think are the, the skills that um, just stand out for me as being particularly important. One I think that often gets overlooked, um, and the other that probably encompasses and kind of leans towards and, and influences all the rest. These are probably not the top of the list that are going to come up if you were to jump onto Google and say, what are the skills my child needs to develop to succeed in the future world of work? Um, but I thought they were perhaps a bit more valuable to touch on as a result. You can go along and Google and learn all about leadership and how to develop those things much more easily. Um, but let's take a look at the, the two that I'm going to just touch on and focus on today. The first, seems my slideshow, there we go. Okay, the first is staying human. Now, the world, as we discussed, is becoming ever more 
tech filled um, and technology is just swallowing jobs, it seems, in many ways, creating new jobs, but also swallowing up um, whole industries that before and, and careers, jobs that before people needed to fulfill. But our competitive advantage as people, the thing that machines have not been able to take over yet, is that we are people, that we have that compassion, that empathy, the reasoning, ability to reason, ability to think critically, and being able as well to bring those skills together in a group. And whether that group for your kid or for, for you is uh, online, remote, whether it's in person or whether it's a hybrid mixture of the two, which is probably the most likely, we need to be able to bring these skills together to be able to get the best result out of our combined thinking and innovation. And your emotional intelligence, your EQ and your self-awareness distinguish you from technology, distinguish you from machines. Therefore, key skill to continue to develop is to strive to keep and develop your human qualities. And some ideas on how we might actually go about doing that. Firstly, is to integrate rather than isolate interact with diverse people. Um, future jobs will require interacting with people from many different backgrounds and cultures. As you said these global boundaries are shrinking. Your colleagues could be halfway across the world. And individuals will need to be able to find common ground with these diverse people in order to achieve shared goals. Future clients or future customers as well will also want to experience that human connection. That's the difference versus a cold job that's being done by a machine. And that's what's going to um, reconnect individuals within their careers and to the people that they are serving. So the important thing here is to just encourage your, your kids, encourage your students, and for you who are students listening as well, to find your own meaning, to find your purpose, learn to know yourself. It's a journey um, and it will change over time, but try to discover what makes you tick and what you're passionate enough about to invest your life or at least the next few years of your life into. This will help you to make better decisions and lead to more satisfaction and joy in your life and career as well. So staying human is really about connecting to those qualities, your emotional intelligence, EQ and self-awareness and really connecting and understanding what your own personal drivers are, what gets you passionate and excited. And kind of linked into that as well, the next point is becoming an intentional, lifelong and fearless learner. It's so easy these days to access vast knowledge and to connect to a range of experiences and opportunities that were just never available before. And one of the best lessons that we can learn or that we can teach our kids is that learning is a lifetime pursuit. Fearless learners are the ones that aren't afraid to fail. They will try something and they will fail, but they will know that that is an opportunity to learn from that experience. It was John C. Maxwell who called it failing forward. So what is this about? It's about learning, encouraging people, to your, your kids to learn and to gather a range of skills, um, gather a range of experiences that interest them as well, to try new things, to have hobbies, to expose themselves to diversity and experiences, to diversity in people, to find things that they're interested in and to learn about those things, but then also to jump out of their comfort zone into other areas, to expand their knowledge, to not get stuck. And the reason or the, the importance is that intentional, fearless learners develop both resilience as well as agility or adaptability that will help them to succeed in this constantly changing world. So they won't end up getting stuck in a rut or getting left behind when the world changes around them. While this future world of work may be quite um, uncertain, but what is becoming more and more apparent is that the future workforce won't be able to depend on having just one lifetime career or a simple skill set in order to succeed. How can we encourage our kids to do that, to become intentional, lifelong 
fearless learners? Well, firstly, by encouraging them to find and to follow passions, to explore, to build curiosity, um, to experience to creativity, to try and to fail and to get up and try again. There are, of course, lots of opportunities out there for learning. There are digital and audiobooks that abound. There are online courses. There's YouTube and TED Talks and podcasts and blogs. Um, literally inexhaustible. And then there are also so many clubs that can be joined as well. Again, the internet makes it so much easier to connect with people that have weird and wonderful common interests. I know of a group out there that's connected online um, that is a club of foragers, for example. So these are people who go out uh, in urban areas onto Table Mountain, for example, and they'll forage around and find little bits of mushrooms and I don't know what else is available out there, but they'll find those and come together again and uh, have a meal from these things that they've foraged uh, from the woods and the forests. So interesting, different, very varied opportunities out there for connecting around common interests or exploring new interests. And then there's definitely a lot to be learned from school and from books, but a important reminder in the space of being a lifelong fearless learner is to not let your academics get in the way of your education. This was something that I picked up quite early in my life during my school years. And, and just to say, I was a straight A student. I was on the Dean's Merits list. I had scholarships throughout university. So this is not the perspective of a slacker who's trying to, to get into um, advocate for not studying. I'm definitely not suggesting ditching studying, but what I am suggesting is pursuing and choosing opportunities that will help kids to learn beyond book knowledge. And that includes learning about those soft skills, developing emotional intelligence as well. Um, those things that will help them to adapt and to apply um, skills to those whatever don't exist yet jobs or roles that they may find themselves in one day. And then lastly, uh, just wrapping up, I'd like to speak just an encouragement to whatever high schoolers or junior schoolers might be out there listening today. This is directly and specifically for you guys. Um, you are your greatest asset. And I just want to encourage you to really invest in yourself. You are teeming with potential, potential that is waiting to be discovered and directed towards an incredible future. And self-awareness is one of the most powerful skills that you can develop. Knowing where you're strong, knowing where you struggle, what are your passions, understanding your personality, your behavioral tendencies, what makes you tick, what are your priorities in life. Some people may have become successful by accident, but I think the overwhelming greater majority are great because they've discovered what they're great at and then intentionally gone and pursued and developed that. So self-awareness, that understanding of your potential really is a secret weapon that you can target at any challenge that life throws at you. We're going to jump over to a time of Q&A. Uh, we've got, seems quite a good bit of time for that. So I hope there are some good questions waiting for us. Before we do, um, this is just where you can, if you'd like to get some more information about Fully Alive, and if you'd like to find out a bit more about those um, coaching opportunities, website is up as well as my email address and yes.xyz is a real top level domain. <laughs> And that wasn't a typo or mistake. Um, you can grab a quick screenshot of this if you'd like, um, but we will be coming back again towards the end uh, to just chat in a little bit more depth about what we can do together. Great, thanks, Meg. That's fantastic. Um, we are gonna have a time of Q&A now. If you do have a question and uh, you'd like to ask either myself or Meg or just start a conversation, uh, we would love to hear from you. So go ahead and open your Q&A now. I do have a few lined up for you, Meg, if you're ready while you've been going. All right. So if your first question is, does my child need a university degree? 
Sure. I think um, this was an inevitable question, I think, that was going to, to come up. And I had, in all honesty, expected that it would come up as well. Um, and the answer may not be very satisfactory for those who like a black and white, but I do honestly believe that it is not a black and white answer. It definitely depends on what are they interested in and also very importantly, how do they learn best? Many kids are just not suited to traditional um, learning methods and by trying to force them into going to study, it's it doesn't come cheap <laughs> and it may end up being a very expensive exercise to, to put them through that. Um, some people do learn better experientially. Um, there are lots of different options out there to learning other than a university degree, whether it's, you know, kind of uh, colleges or, or those types of things as well. Um, lots of online opportunities, that type of thing too. And then internships, learnerships, experiential ways of learning. Um, but I definitely don't think that it's for everyone. And I would encourage any parent and any kid as well to have a good discussion and wise discussion about that um, before pushing towards either direction. Yeah, I agree. And Meg, I think I'd add on to that. Um, that last piece that you've said now about making a wise decision and, and engaging with each other um, connects to that is the idea of, of engaging with, with people ex who are experienced in helping you to unpack this, helping you to understand this and make those wise choices. Um, uh, you don't want to make a choice like this out of fear or ignorance. One of the things that we love saying at COA is um, we're excited that parents have more choice than they've ever had before when it comes to education. But we know that what comes along with that is the daunting process of trying to understand your options. And so mm -hmm. for, for many of us, when we graduated from grade 12, our option was pretty much university or not. And the not didn't really include very many options. But today, it, it's, it's almost overwhelming for parents, the, the, the amount of choice that they have when it comes to how we go about educating our kids. Um, even when you just look in the area of university, there are many different types of universities now. Mm -hmm. And so making those choices is quite hard. It, it is something that you want to take your time over. It is something that you want to engage with your child on. Um, and just by the by, someone like Meg would probably be a, a helpful person to, to loop in on that conversation. Um, okay. I have, um, sorry, Mark, if I can compliment that as well. I have chatted with uh, many young people, um, some who are kind of transitioning into university, trying to make decisions. Um, I've even had situations where, you know, we've, we've had a coaching session, it's been overwhelmingly apparent that the kid to probably not go off and study engineering, but, you know, it's, it's family just feels like that traditional route is still important. Go into studying and kid does not enjoy it um, at all and ends up dropping out part the way through. So there are definitely situations like that. I think the other important thing to remember as well, though, is that uh, any education opportunities, university included, it's not always just about the subject matter that you are learning about. You're learning important ways of thinking. University is a big jump up from what is expected of you at school level to suddenly what's expected of you at university level. And I am one of those people who is not working in the field in which I studied specifically, but the skills and the ways of thinking and approaches to life and work that I learned through those years, I'm definitely using every single day of my life. So another kind of stone to throw into the pot that is still not a definitive answer, um, but hopefully something else that will help in those wise conversations as we were saying. Super, thanks Meg. It's definitely not a one size fits all answer. Um, here's another question for you, Meg. I think this one probably falls more in your wheelhouse than mine. Um, and it's probably off the back of your comments about uh, sort of how you see your role and career guidance. And the question is, 
is traditional career guidance still relevant for my child? Hmm, another good question. Um, I'm assuming that by traditional career guidance, um, it might mean some of the assessment tools and processes that we, our generation may have gone through um, in which there's kind of a bunch of questions that you're asked, um, magic box that gets shaken up and data that gets churned and out the other side, pops a response um, about the career that you should follow. Um, I would also be wary of those tools. Um, I, it definitely depends from one practitioner to the next. I'm not going to just, you know, kind of put a blanket uh, ruling out there and, and say that all will operate in the same way. But I think the danger in those tools is that the, the data that is being used is based on the past and you're trying to make a decision about the future. So we've already just discussed how all of these careers don't exist yet that the kids may be doing one day. And so we're using data from the past in order to tell them this is what you should study in order to do this career, but the career that they actually may end up in doesn't necessarily exist. Um, and so that's why for me, um, it actually kind of comes a step before that or, or the tools and the kind of assistance that I provide is the step before that. It's about helping to, to make those decisions. As I said, I'm, I'm not kind of the person who can give those definitive answers about you should become an accountant or a teacher or whatever the case may be, um, but to give you that kind of understanding of yourself and of decision processes and how to go about applying that self-awareness to your decision processes in order to make a better decision. Mm, that's great, Meg. I think it, what, it, what it does is it differentiates the idea that what's going to bring me fulfillment and satisfaction and success in life is a, a, a description of a, a job type or a title that what's going to make me successful and, and, and sort of self-fulfilled in life is going to be being a blank and insert job here, you know, job name. And if I'm not that type of job, then I won't be successful or I won't be happy or, you know, I won't earn enough money or, or whatever the case is. Um, and I think especially with the, the fluidity that we see in the marketplace these days, where previously, you know, we, we see people in very linear trajectories through their career, which, which was good and healthy, but, but now we see a lot more convergent and divergent paths in with the workplace and actually thinking of ourselves very narrowly in this is the trajectory that will ultimately get me what I need can end up missing opportunities along the way which which would have brought you know more um, and so I, I really like that you're calling us back to what are the underlying things that you're really looking for when it comes to your child's future or your future um, if you're in, in high school um, and and that those are lasting no matter what job you end up in because you might well end up being an engineer, uh, you might well end up being an, an accountant, but um, that's yeah. sort of not the not the heart of it. Yeah. So um, in that space of as I said, purpose and potential coaching, um, in the purpose space, it does actually often come down even to articulating for an individual a statement of purpose of this is the impact, the contribution that I want to make in the world. And that statement of purpose is as much who you are in your workplace as well as who you are in your personal life. So it's quite generalized. And in many cases, when you take that statement of purpose and you read out an individual's purpose, it could be anybody from a landscaper to a coffee shop owner to a nurse that all has the same purpose, underlying purpose that, that drives them. So it's not actually linked to the career. It's linked to the difference that you want to make in the lives of the people that you interact with through your career. And the valuable thing there as well is that then as you are going about whatever job you find yourself in, you can see and look for it and try to intentionally create opportunities for the work that you're doing to link back to that purpose. And through that, you then can find that 
passion, that excitement, that joy, as you were saying, Mark, in whatever context it is that you find yourself in. It's not about the specific role or the specific job. It's about clicking your mindset over and, and connecting it into that underlying purpose that you have. Mm, that's good. And it, it reminds me of the poll that you did where we asked parents um, how confident of you are your child's sort of future career. And nobody said 100%. And yeah. half of the, the, the audience today said, you know, overwhelmed, you know, mm. <laughs> uncertain and overwhelmed. And when I have conversations uh, as a principal with parents, uh, some of what I hear coming back is, I don't know what job my child will have one day. And that's bringing me anxiety. I don't know what subject choices they should take, you know, in grade 10 to get them the job that they need. And they don't even know what job they want to have. And I think it's, uh, it's anxiety reducing to hear the message. That's actually not necessarily a bad thing not to know the job that your child's going to have one day is what we should be helping our children to pursue now is unlocking who they are and what their, their pur pur purpose and their passion is and keeping those channels open so that they can pursue those, those one day. Um, Here's another one for you, Meg. Um, the question is, how do you deal with a perfectionist who's afraid to try because of her fear of failure? Wow. <laughs> that is not an easy question at all. Um, I think, so one of the things that I often chat with people, so I think perfectionism um, it comes around also to a bit of risk aversion, right? Not wanting to, that, that the context that that question described is not wanting to take that risk of failing, um, the, the uncertainty behind doing so. So one of the things that I encourage coaches to do in that type of situation is to simply start small. Um, if you're risk averse, trying to get somebody to skydive or jump off a building <laughs> is probably not going to be very successful. It's too much of a risk. It's actually too much. Um, but if we can just get our heads around jumping off a step first and then seeing that it's okay, it was safe to jump off that step and seeing what the outcome is, what the results were. Um, and then after that, maybe jumping from a slightly higher step in, in the next round. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's definitely a progressive thing with with a perfectionist as well, starting small and helping the individual to to just see that um, less than hundred percent is not as much of a disaster um, as they think it might be, and then progressing further from there. Absolutely, um, Meg, that's fantastic. I, I I'm in particular am passionate about this topic of. <laughs> what it means to fail and fear of failure. As, a, as an educator, as a principal, um, I, I really love having this conversation with the kids um, because we have taught them for years and years and years, we have taught them to be scared of failing. So mm -hmm. being scared of failure, by the way, is, is, is not natural for most kids that you look at you sort of a, a one and two year old they're not scared to make mistakes they're not scared to fail they're they, they, they're learning all the time they want to know how I learn from my failures and what happens if I do this and oh that didn't work let me try something else and they're exploring all the time and falling and failing and learning and and our education system I firmly believe has taught kids to be afraid of failing and mm -hmm. something that I'm loving seeing in education at the moment is a shift away from achievement-based education towards mastery-based education. Yeah. And the difference there is they're both high in terms of outcome and standard and what we want to achieve in terms of content acquisition and content application. So they're both robust in terms of, of, of education, but what achievement-based education teaches us is I'm going to teach you something for a series of weeks, then I'm going to test you. And based on the results of your test, you either get 90% well done, you know, 70% not too bad, 40%, you're not that great. But guess what? We're moving on. And that 40% is a fail. And I'm putting an F in your column. And, and we're moving on. And you don't get a chance to do anything with the other 60% that you missed. And that all that teaches us is to be scared of failure. What I'm loving seeing at the moment, and we're seeing the shift in education, particularly open up in the online space, and particularly in grades 
one to nine um, is we're seeing the ability for schools to do mastery based learning where it's learning at your own pace and you're, you're cycling through things in a way that you progress when you're ready to progress. And that actually doesn't slow the kids down. It actually, in, in a lot of situations, they end up moving faster and they end up building confidence. So I think my answer to the question would be, I would love to engage with this person more. Please drop us an email. Would love to have a conversation to find out about your particular situation because it does depend largely on your child and what, what they're doing when you talk about fear of failure. But my, my general advice would be find ways to take what they're scared of failing in and make it mastery based where it's okay to fail and there are no consequences to failing other than let's learn from that and try again. And then you'll see the confidence grow over time as we realize, oh, I can learn from that. I can try again. I can improve to the point where, wow, I'm actually really good at this. I've, I've mastered this. And that links, Meg, to what you were saying about uh, you don't go from zero to hero. You sort of, you, you build that up in stages. And, and really, that's gaining mastery. Um, just a comment on the back of this as well, Sonia. I see your recommendation. Thank you so much. And I think it relates to this question. Uh, Sonia has recommended a talk for parents. It's called How Falling Behind Can Get You Ahead, which is an intriguing topic. I haven't watched that one myself, um, but it's a TEDx talk. Uh, and so you might want to go and Google that, How Falling Behind Can Get You Ahead. Sounds like an interesting watch. Thanks, Sonia. All right. Okay, I've got one more question here, and then uh, Meg, we're going to close it off. Uh, I'm aware that we're about to run out of time, but this is an interesting question, so I'm going to read it out. I think this might be a question for me. It says, uh, good evening, regarding the current IEB curriculum, still being very content focused, what progress, if any, is being made to make appropriate changes to the curriculum and incorporate significantly more of the very necessary soft skills? What a fantastic question. I feel like if you're not a teacher, you should be, because this, this is an educator's question at heart. I love it. Um, and so the question here is really what's happening in terms of, of curriculum. And you, you've used the, the IEB curriculum here, and I'll touch on the IEB in a moment, but really the, the underlying heart of this question, you could apply to any curriculum, uh, whether we're talking about government NEC or IEB or Cambridge. Um, and the, the question is really, are we, are we really shifting from a very content-focused education, a content-focused curriculum, to something that resembles what Meg and I have been talking about tonight? The answer is both yes and very slowly. Uh, yes, we have been making that shift, and it's been happening very slowly. Fortunately, the last few years, when we talk about disruption to the way that we do work, we've seen that in education spaces as well. So we've seen that very slowly turning ship actually turn a lot faster in the last few years and opportunities have opened up for us to be able to rethink how we do education. Uh, so a couple of examples from my experience and what's happening in, in the online space. Um, at our online school, we're able to really rethink particularly grade four to nine. Um, the legislation is different for grades one to nine than it is for grades 10 to 12. So when you're thinking about curriculum, that's something to bear in mind is that the way that we are legislated, the way that we are enforced to teach from grade one to nine, the rules are different for grade 10 to 12. And one to nine, we've got a little bit more flexibility in how we go about approaching the content. No matter what school you're in, whether it's IEB or government NSC, your underlying curriculum is CAPS. You have to cover the same content body. What we're able to do at COA, particularly in the online space, is rethink how we go about addressing that content. And so we've really got creative in terms of doing, uh, you don't do a timetable where you do geography and then history and then science. We do an integrated approach where we're doing things called engaged tasks. That's one example of how we can really rethink the underlying curriculum while still covering the same content, but in a much more applied, real world relevant, uh, less anxiety provoking, more mastery based approach. When it comes to grade 10 to 12, the answer, unfortunately, is still very much focused on content, underlying content that needs to be covered, and quite a rigorous assessment protocol. And the reason for that is grade 12 exams haven't changed. So you have to prepare for grade 12 exams. And because of that, there are, there's quite a strict protocol in terms of how you go about teaching, what you teach, and how you assess it. 
specifically to do with your question. Fortunately, the IEB gives the most flexibility in grade 10 to 12. That's why as co-academy, we in particular chose the IEB because it gives us the most flexibility in how we address that grade 10 to 12 curriculum. Um, and it also is more focused on application than it is memorization. It's the same underlying content. We have to cover the same content, but the way that we assess it is more focused on how do you apply that content and how do you understand that content as opposed to can you memorize and repeat that content. Hope that answers some of your question. All right, Meg, there are, there are a couple of other questions, but I think we'll be able to handle those in the follow-up. Um, I just want to say firstly a, a big thank you to everybody who's uh, joined us tonight. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, thank you especially to Meg for being with us. We really appreciate your time and your wisdom and your experience. And uh, I just want to close off this evening by uh, giving everybody who's attending a, a couple of pointers here, particularly when it comes to Meg and Fully Alive, because like I said at the beginning of the session, uh, we, we really are appreciative of uh, Meg's input into what we're doing at COA even. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about what Meg uh, is doing at Fully Alive. Um, thinking especially of her involvement, she, she operates in the two spheres of working with individuals or working with groups and teams, thinking especially of working with individuals when it comes to your child, uh, particularly if your child is older high school. So here we're looking at 16 years old and up. At that sort of point, you can really call in Meg to come and give you some, some professional support. She offers purpose and potential coaching. This comes in three tools. Um, there's personal purpose, there's Clifton Strengths, and I personally use Clifton Strengths and found it incredibly useful. Uh, both in my career and my personal life. So definitely worth investigating with Meg. And thirdly, career direct. And I want to draw your attention to career direct. This might be something that as parents you're interested in, or if you're in grade 10, 11, 12, you might be interested in contacting Meg about this. Career direct is think of career guidance, but then add a more holistic approach where you're dealing with personality, values, interests, skills, all packaged together. Um, it's an online assessment and coaching session, and it's geared for ages 16 and up. So if that sounds like the type of thing that you'd be interested in tapping into, go and have a look. Meg's website is fullyalive.xyz. That's right, .xyz. And uh, you can get in touch with her there. And if you are a Coa Academy family, if you attend Coa Academy, Meg will give you a 5% discount as one of our uh, partners. So thank you very much, Meg, for that discount offer. And uh, I'd really encourage all of our families to, to make, make use of that. Definitely uh, money well spent, if you ask me. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Thanks again, Meg. I appreciate you being here. And if you want to say goodbye. Yes, thank you too, Mark. It has been absolutely exciting um, to all of those uh, attendees that are out there as well. Thank you so much for joining us. The questions as well kept me on my toes and had to think on the spot there, but really, really good questions. So it's definitely exciting to see um, that those are the types of things that people are thinking about as well in this space. Thanks again, Mark, and thank you everybody for your time. Absolutely, Meg. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.